All right, Quantog, I got my, um, I just moved my office around, and I have a microphone over here. I know there's some sound going on. Hopefully, this will be okay. I'm going to keep it short. We'll see. Um, because, uh, maybe I'll have to remake it. So, uh, in the Middle East, I mean, I just think it's funny. People have weird ideas, and it's overcomplicated on purpose. It can't be the people that don't understand it that have overcomplicated it, right? It's got to be coming from somewhere else. When I was growing up, and this stuff was all blowing up, we had a, a Boonie Doll and all of this, and the PLO, and, you know, it's been hot my whole life. It's been this major thing. I remember the Shah. I remember the, you know, crisis in Iran. You know, the hostages. And, um, you know, they just tell you things like, oh, they've been fighting over there forever. They've been fighting. That's just the truism of humans around the world. It, it, it's obvious that if people in certain situations certain human characteristics rise to the top. Different human personalities rise to the top depending on the conditions that the humans are living in. Depending on the conditions that the humans are living in, it's probably not an accident. It's like a kind of social level epigenetics, okay? Because you have all kinds of people in certain situations nurture certain kinds of people. Now, oppressive situations nurture violent, don't give a shit, crazy people and even schizophrenics and people that just have that extra uh, craziness that allows them to say, you know what, yeah, 99.9% .9 of the people are going to follow this conformity because we're slaves and we get beat and our children are murdered if we don't and it's just as bad and they'll fight anyway. So if you put a situation uh, down uh, on a people that's that desperate, then he, the most desperate type of personality will gain power within them, right? Now, measured that way, um, you know, it's not at all a surprise what's going on. There's nothing mysterious. It's not that they just fight for millions of years any more than anybody else over in the Middle East, okay? It's that, as you probably know or, or would agree, I think, or anyway, it's undeniable. I mean, what happened is the British discovered oil at the beginning of the 20th century. You know, QED. Right. There's more to it than that, is that, of course, they had this empire's attitude where they didn't let Iran in on this tremendous wealth. Right? They, they didn't let them in on the tremendous wealth. They just treated them as these factory oil workers. They didn't turn them into engineers. They didn't provide local investment. And even for those who might say, well, they made a deal with the Iranians to, you know, take the oil, you know, and go refine it and use it. So they didn't develop more of an oil company, uh, an oil economy infrastructure uh, with, you know, colleges and engineers being trained and stuff. Um, but, hey, they made a deal. Well, you know, history has audited this, and actually British Petroleum, as it's now called, the uh, Anglo-Iranian oil company or whatever it was. You know, they didn't even, they also cheated on paying for the crude. They just cheated. They oppressed those people. Okay, so the people a few decades later had enough of that shit. Okay. And um, uh, they put in a democratically elected leader and then they were overthrown. That pissed them off, you know. And then on and on. It's, it's this, these kinds of stories throughout the whole Middle East. In Saudi Arabia, you have it where the Americans got in on it, and uh, uh, this House of Saud, you know, was able to go and just conquer this whole huge area. It had nothing to do with his, it's not like historically that family had controlled the whole area, but they went with arms, you know, and they, of course, these henchmen that went and created this whole huge country and named it after their family, they have been rewarded, but look, uh, in, in the Middle East, are, are countries that have historically had, uh, since the oil era, uh, the most, the highest average wealth, and yet also the people of the least. In other words, you have such a huge separation that even though per capita they have more money than all, most other countries, the average person has way, way less. They've been kept third worldified. Why? Well, because they're, they're getting raped. And you are creating a situation 
uh, where you're going to have radicalism. And in Saudi Arabia, what they said is, well, we know that's going to happen. We can turn this radicalism to our favor. So they have nurtured this anti-American radicalism, even though they're in bed with um, with America from almost the start of uh, their empire, at least the West. So um, I think it's pretty clear where all that animosity comes from. Now, it's kind of like uh, the West was in the situation after the age of empire there of, um, you know, geez, everybody's mad at us. They don't even want to talk. They don't want to be reasonable. It's like, well, why? What happened? Well, uh, we raped them. Okay, yeah, it's probably going to be hard to open a conversation, but you could always, like, stop raping them. You know, stop, keep raping them. Stop keeping raping them. Stopping that keeping of the still doing it thing. In other words, we have to develop them. When we went into Iraq, we should have spent billions of dollars investing it in local Iraqi engineering companies. This is not hindsight. I said this at the time, right? We should not have given Halliburton a billion to do something. We should have created and nurtured local engineering companies. Iraq at one time had a great engineering industry, right? We needed to find the remnants of that and fund it. And we would, people, the stockholders in the West would be making profits off of that right now, right, instead of ISIS taking over. It's simple. You create a certain kind of condition. Now, on the other hand, Kornfog, you said, let's stop drawing pro the Muhammad prophet. No, I'm sorry, giving in to the radical side or those sensitivities. No, you know, if just don't look at it if that's part of your religion. Every religion needs to face the fact they live on this earth with all the other religions, and, and we're only going to put up, we secular atheists that agree with me, <laughs> that's upset. We're only going to put up with religions that somehow discover some principle of tolerance. Um, you know, it, there just has to be. And, uh, Islam absolutely has that. There are plenty of Islamic leaders that meet with the Pope and atheists and Jewish leaders and, and have that kind of uh, more, um, you know, a, a big picture of what they want their spirituality to be about. So it's not a problem that, that those systems, even the terrible things that are written in the book, that, the, that they can't learn tolerance. And, um, and that's all that's really required of them. So uh, free speech is important, and you can draw anything, and Muhammad isn't real. So drawing a shape and saying, that's Muhammad, that's the part that's really illegal. Calling a drawing Muhammad, if you mean that Muhammad, is, yeah, fuck that. I don't believe in getting into that at all. As a matter of fact, I think every newspaper on the planet should print an image of, of Muhammad. And... Um, uh, as a, in protest, you know, and and I think uh, it's reasonable to. That's not the provocation that's important. We just need to stop actually raping them over there and blowing up their actual kids and stuff. I think that's enough. All right, cheers. <laughs>